RSA stands for Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. That's actually the last name of the three gentlemen that created the algorithm back in 1977. RSA is by far the most popular asymmetric encryption algorithm in use today. What RSA does is it creates a pair of commutative keys. What that means is you get a set of keys where you can encrypt with one of the keys and decrypt with the other, and it doesn't matter which order you go in. Everything we had discussed in a prior lesson of this module with Pam and Jim and what they can do with their private and public keys is an example of what RSA can do. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there are other asymmetric encryption algorithms, for instance, Diffie-Hellman and the digital signature algorithm. Those work slightly different. Those don't create a commutative set of keys. That's only RSA. Now, we'll unpack Diffie-Hellman and digital signature algorithm later on in this course. In this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the RSA algorithm. This slide and the last slide of this particular lesson is all you really need to know about RSA. What we're about to do next is going to go into the math of the RSA algorithm. The purpose of this is to prove the commutative property of asymmetric encryption. At no time will you ever have to manually redo the math to make sure a particular server did it correctly. The only purpose of showing you the math is to prove this behavior. If you're anything like me, you were probably told at one point that asymmetric encryption allows you to encrypt with the public key and decrypt with the private key and so on. But it didn't actually click for me until I saw the math. So that's why I want to bring you through the math as well. If math is not something you're interested in, by all means, go ahead and skip forward to the last slide in this lecture where we discuss the security of RSA. For the rest of us, we are going to look at an example of the RSA algorithm. Now, before we look at an example of the RSA math, we have to review a few math terms. There's four words we have to define before we can look at RSA. Starting with the word factor. A factor is simply any numbers you multiply to get the original number. For example, these are the factors of 12. I can multiply 1 and 12 to get 12, or 2 and 6 to get 12, or 3 and 4 to get 12. Hence, any one of these is a factor of 12. Keep in mind, the numbers don't have to be said in their pair. For example, I can say 2 and 3 are factors of 12. I don't necessarily have to pair 3 and 4 together or 2 and 6 together. Any numbers you can multiply to get the original number is a factor. Here is another example. Here are the factors of 7. You'll notice 7 only has two factors, 1 and itself. Every number will always be divisible by 1 and itself. But when a number is only divisible by 1 and itself, you get what's known as a prime number. 7 is a prime number. You'll notice that 7 only has two factors, 1 and itself. That's what makes it prime. Here are examples of other prime numbers. Any of these numbers only have two factors, 1 and themselves. Another way of defining a prime number is simply any number that's only divisible by 1 in itself. These two definitions are pretty much the exact same thing. The next math term we want to discuss is what's known as a semi-prime number. A semi-prime number is a number whose factors are prime. For example, 21 is a semi-prime number, and the factors of 21 are 1, 3, 7, and 21. Now, every number is always divisible by 1 in itself, so we can ignore those. The only remaining factors of 21 are 3 and 7, and you'll notice those are both prime numbers. That's what make 21 a semi-prime number. Here's a hint. Anytime you multiply two prime numbers, the result is always semi-prime. So I can multiply 3 and 7 to get 21, and 21 is semi-prime. I could have also multiplied 5 and 11 to get 55, and 55 is a semi-prime number. So anytime you multiply two prime numbers, you get a semi-prime number. Finally, the last term we have to review is modulo, and that sounds more complicated than it is. All modulo is is simply remainder division. For example, if I gave you the problem 13 mod 5, what I'm asking you is to tell me what's left over after you divide 13 by 5. Well, 5 can go into 13 twice evenly, that'll get you up to 10, and you have 3 left over between 10 and 13. Another example, if I were to give you 21 mod 5, I'm asking you, What's left over if you divide 21 by 5? Well, 5 can go into 21 four times evenly. That'll get you to 20, and you have 1 left over. And a final example, if I were to ask you 25 mod 5, I'm asking you what's left over if I divide 25 by 5? Well, since 5 can go into 25 evenly, there's 0 left over. If you understand these four terms, you are now ready to actually see the math behind the RSA algorithm. 
there are two steps to the RSA algorithm. The first step is generating keys. The second step is actually using them for encryption and decryption. So here we're going to focus on the first step, generating keys. The first thing you have to do is select two prime numbers. We're going to call these numbers P and Q, and for the sake of this example, our prime numbers are going to be 7 and 19. The next thing you have to do is then multiply them together. You're going to multiply P times Q. So we'll do this together, and that gives us 7 times 19, which gives us 133. We're going to call this value N. Now, given what we just discussed, can you identify what type of number 133 is? Hopefully you're able to put together that 133 is a semi-prime number, because the result of 133 came from multiplying two prime numbers. Next, we're going to calculate the totient. Now, the definition of the totient is actually pretty deep in the mathematics world. You have to understand things like Euclid's algorithm and the phi of n and a bunch of different things. I don't know math to that degree, but I do know that apparently, to get the totient of a semi-prime number, all you have to do is subtract one from each of the primes and multiply them together. And this I can do pretty easily. So for us, our two prime numbers were 7 and 19, which means I'd be multiplying 7 minus 1, which is 6, times 19 minus 1, which is 18, and that'll get me 108. We're going to call this value t. Now that I have my prime numbers, my n number, the product, and my totient, I can now calculate a public key. The public key must match three conditions. The first, the public key has to be a prime number. The second is that it has to be less than the totient, that's 108. And finally, it cannot be a factor of the totient. So let's run through the example using the number three. Well, three is a prime number, so it satisfies the first requirement. Three is less than 108, so it satisfies the second requirement. But let's see if three is a factor of the totient. Well, one way of calculating factors is by taking the number and finding the modulus when divided by three. If you get a zero, this tells you three is indeed a factor of the totient, which means we cannot use three as a public key value. There are many values that we could use, however. For example, five. Five is prime. Five is less than the totient. And if we did the exact same math, 108 mod five, you'll see that there is a remainder, meaning five is not a factor of the totient. So five would totally be acceptable for this example. Now for the sake of my slides, we're going to go ahead and use the public key value of 29. 29 is a prime number, 29 is less than 108, and 29 is not a factor of 108, because there's a remainder when you do the modulus operation. So our public key value, which we're going to call E, is going to be 29. And now that we have a public key, we can do the last step, which is to select a private key. Now the private key must only match one condition, but it's a slightly more involved condition. The private key must meet this condition. If you multiply the private key and the public key, and then divide it by t, our totient, the remainder must be one. Another way of looking at it is it must make this statement true. Now, for the sake of these slides, we're going to use the private key value of 41, but let's go ahead and punch it through this formula to see if it meets that condition. I'm going to take my private key, which is 41, and I'm going to multiply it by my public key, which is 29, and then I'm going to figure out the remainder when divided by the totient, which is 108. If I hit enter, you'll notice the result is 1, which means the private key value of 41 does indeed match this condition. So now that we have public and private keys, let's actually use them for encryption and decryption. For encryption with RSA, what I'm going to do is take the message that I want to encrypt and raise it to our public key value. Then I'm going to figure out the remainder when divided by n. That's going to get me the ciphertext. To decrypt, I'm going to take that ciphertext and raise it to the private key value, and then figure out the remainder when divided by n. And if RSA works the way it said it does, that should get me the same message that I started with. So let's go ahead and test it. We're going to use a message value of 60. 60 is going to be our starting message. And we're going to simply step through these formulas to prove how RSA works. So let's start by encrypting with a public key and then seeing if we can decrypt with a correlating private key. So to encrypt with the public key, I'm going to take my message, which is 60. 
and I'm going to raise it to 29, which is my public key. 60 raised to the 29th, that gets me that. And I'm going to figure out the remainder when divided by 133. The result is 86, which means 86 is the ciphertext of encrypting this message, 60, with this public key. Theoretically, I'll be able to use this formula and my private key to decrypt that back into the original message. So let's give it a shot. If I do 86, which is my ciphertext, and I raise it to the 41st power, then I figure out the remainder when divided by 133. I hit enter, you'll see that I was indeed able to land back on 60. So this proves that RSA works the way it said it does. I was able to encrypt the message of 60 with the public key and decrypt the resulting ciphertext with the private key. But remember I told you that RSA is commutative, which is to say you can encrypt with the public key and decrypt with the private key, or you can encrypt with the private key and decrypt with the public key. So we're not quite done proving how RSA works. Let's go ahead and switch the public key and the private key in our formulas and see if we can still encrypt and decrypt and result with the same message. So let's encrypt the same message, except this time we're going to do the encryption with the private key and the decryption with the public key. So what I'm going to calculate for encryption with the private key is 60, our message, raised to our private key value, which is 41. And then I'm going to figure out the remainder when divided by 133. That gets me 72. This is now the ciphertext after encrypting with the private key. So let's see if I can take that ciphertext and decrypt it with the public key. So again, I'm going to take 72, my ciphertext, and I'm going to raise it to the public key of 29. Then I'm going to figure out the remainder when divided by 133, and you'll see that that lands me back at the original message of 60. So now we have just proven RSA. We've shown you how to generate keys, and we've showed you how to encrypt with the public key, decrypt with the private, and that you can also encrypt with the private key and decrypt with the public. That is the math behind RSA. Now, of course, you and I use very small numbers for this example. In reality, RSA uses much bigger numbers. But how secure is RSA? Well, the security of RSA lies in the difficulty of factoring semi-prime numbers. Remember, our semi-prime number was 133. And if I gave you the semi-prime number of 133, could you extract the factors of 7 and 19? Some of you might think you can. Well, prove it. Let me give you a bigger semi-prime number. 1909 is a semi-prime number. Feel free to pause the video and tell me the prime factors. While you're doing that, I'm going to continue on. Let me tell you a story about the security of RSA. In 1991, RSA Labs created the RSA Challenge. They released 54 different semi-prime numbers of various sizes and offered cash prizes for anybody that could drive the prime factors. Now, these weren't small cash prizes either. This wasn't like a, you know, $15 iTunes gift certificate. This was something like, hey, if you solve these factors, we'll give you $10,000, $25,000, $50,000, $100,000. The cash reward grew with the size of the semi-prime number that you factored. The competition ended in 2007, and only 12 of the original 54 had been solved. But of course, since we are all a bunch of nerds in this field, many people continue to try and solve these just for the sake of bragging rights. So as of 2020, another 11 were solved. Of course, since the competition was ended, these 11 didn't actually net cash prizes. Either way, since 1991, the biggest semi-prime that was factored was 829 bits. That was done in February of 2020. In the almost 30 years since these numbers were originally published, the 1024-bit number that they released has never been factored. And to give you a comparison to what we use in the industry, 1024-bit keys has been the minimum since 2002, and in 2015, we bumped that up to 2048. Some of you might have been working on this number. Well, that number is only 11 bits. An actual 1024-bit number looks like this. This is actually the 1024-bit semi-prime number that RSA Labs published in 1991. This number has to date never been factored. So that's a quick rundown on the security of RSA. And that wraps up our lesson on RSA. The main takeaways is understanding that RSA creates a pair of commutative keys, 
and seeing the math in action so that you understand how RSA works, not based upon just my word for it, but actually doing the math together. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed that lesson, then you'll also enjoy the full course that it came from, Practical TLS. It's a deep dive into SSL and TLS, taught methodically and intentionally, full of easy illustrations and in the simplest way possible. You'll get to learn cryptography, certificates, private keys, the handshake, OpenSSL, and everything you need to become an SSL expert. To learn more, check out pracnet.net slash TLS, and if you need more convincing that this is the best TLS training course, then check out the other free lesson previews on YouTube. Thank you, and have a great day.